Okay, it's 10 o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all very much uh, for attending our online public meeting for Tulsa Transit to discuss microtransit and possible pilot programs. My name is Barrett Waller. Uh, I'm with Propeller Communications, and uh, we're one of the consultants helping Tulsa Transit with this project. So just to kick things off, I wanted to go through just the agenda, some of the things we'll be talking about today, and then go over some of the house rules and how to ask questions. So um, the agenda for today, um, and uh, we'll have several times when we can ask questions, but uh, again, I'll go over the house rules. Uh, we're gonna talk about the meeting purpose and really why we're here and the goal of the project of microtransit. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about microtransit. Some of you may not know what that is. So we're gonna go into more detail about that. Then look at some of the, the microtransit zones here in Tulsa that we're looking at for possible pilot programs. Um, we have a feedback tool that we'd like to, to take you through just to get your feedback, which is one of the important parts of this meeting. And then we'll have some question and answer time and then go through the project timeline and then talk about what the next steps are. And I just uh, wanted to make sure everyone knows that we are recording this meeting just so Tulsa Transit can use parts of it uh, to um, you know, look at the feedback, but also to put on their website just to help educate more people about microtransit. So uh, the house rules are, um, and most of you already are, but please keep yourself on mute until we uh, have one of the question and answer sessions just to keep some of the background noise um, to, to a minimum. Um, we'll have uh, several question and answer sessions during the presentation. So if you can please hold your questions until then, uh, then we'll open it up for questions. You can unmute yourself and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, if you don't mind, please keep your questions relevant to the topic of microtransit. Uh, we know Tulsa Transit is doing a lot of great things right now, but at least for this meeting, we'd like to really focus on microtransit uh, and um, keep that the main topic of this meeting. Um, if as we're going through some of the, the information about microtransit, if you need clarification about anything, um, please use the chat feature or uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, if you go to reactions, you can raise your hand and we have some people watching that and the chat. Just if you need clarification on a specific issue, uh, we'll make sure and note that. And um, one of our people will just ask a clarifying question just so we don't get too far down the line. But then if you can hold some of your bigger questions and then you can ask that yourself when we have the Q and A session. Um, when we do have Q and A session, uh, if you'd be mindful of time, please, and just uh, let's make sure we give everyone a chance to be heard. So um, just if you can keep your questions concise, uh, and then uh, we'll answer it the best we can. And we know that some people may be joining by phone and not have access to ask online questions. So you can email your questions to info at tulsatransit.org. We're monitoring that as well right now. So uh, you can ask a question and then we'll make sure and ask one of the presenters when we get to the Q&A session. So uh, right now I'd like to pass it on to Leanne Alfaro, who is the planning and marketing director for Tulsa Transit. And she's gonna get us kicked off for the actual meeting. Leanne? Thank you, Barrett. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, Tulsa Transit um, is super excited to be looking into the possibilities of how we can provide um, a better service to our constituents of Tulsa and surrounding areas. Um, as we've all learned through the pandemic, um, our lives have changed, things have changed the way we do things. Um, and the way that people look and react to public transportation has also changed. So that's what has brought us to this point. Um, so we want to be able to better serve our Tulsa Transit riders in markets where there may be low ridership. Um, we are looking to see um, in those areas, which we'll see later on, about providing a pilot program. Um, so we had to kind of narrow down some of our lower, lower ridership areas, uh, I'm sorry, routes, and um, kind of choose from those. And so right now we're going to be looking at our Nightline and Sunday routes as well as our Workforce Express uh, network, and also a possibility of the Broken Arrow route, which currently is the Route 508. 
So the meeting purpose today is to inform our public uh, about what microtransit really is um, and what it could actually look like for Tulsa and what the experience could be like. Um, and in that, we also hope that our purpose today will be to gain feedback um, of, from the public about the pilot areas. Um, that's one thing that's very important to me is I wanna make sure that one, we all understand this is definitely a, gonna be a pilot program, which means as we all know, that's gonna test it, to test the waters and see where we're at. And then the second thing is I want to be able to receive the feedback of our current users as well as the public to support public transportation on what areas they think should be our first area to pilot. And with that, I am going to turn it over, I believe, to Allison. Yes. Thank you, Leanne. Thank uh, you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Bushwack. I'm on the consultant team for this project. I'm a project manager with HNTB based in our Kansas City office. And um, I'll be taking walking us through the next parts of our presentation. But before I do that, I'd like the rest of our team here to introduce themselves. Um, Barrett and Leanne already introduced themselves. So I'll ask next for any other Tulsa Transit staff on our call to go ahead and introduce themselves. Yeah, my name is Chase Phillips. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Service Development at Tulsa Transit. Um, I'm assisting with this project as well. I'm uh, Randy Cloud. I'm the Director of Maintenance uh, for Tulsa Transit and also the uh, Interim General Manager. Thank you. And the rest. That's 1 800 239 67. Thank you. Um, and then the rest of the consultant team. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Billings. I'm a transportation planner with HNTV out of the Oklahoma office. Christy? Hi, Christy White. I'm with Propeller Communications. And Carol Schweiger with Schweiger Consulting, helping out the consultant team. Great. All right, so now I think we're ready to dive into what is microtransit. Uh, so microtransit is a service uh, operated by the transit agency where a passenger would request a ride either through their smartphone or by calling the transit agency directly. And then sort of the, um, the advantage of microtransit and how it functions today is that there's a scheduling software that functions in real time to take that passenger's ride request and match it with vehicles that are available to pick them up and take them to um, their preferred destination. And that would be done in a microtransit vehicle um, which I'll talk a little bit more about those vehicles on a subsequent slide. Um, but generally you can expect that your ride will either be a solo ride or a small carpool of one to a few passengers. Generally, uh, we aim to design the service uh, to have a wait time between a passenger request and when they're actually picked up of about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, there would be no need to call uh, hours or a day in advance to get a ride. And then um, this service would be available to anyone that's within a microtransit zone. Um, so there aren't any sort of specific eligibility standards that you would have to meet. This is available to the general public so long as with, you're within the service area of a zone. Um, so speaking of the zones, um, to explain this a little bit more, in contrast to a traditional bus, which operates on a fixed route through a community and on a specific schedule, microtransit operates within a zone. So you have microtransit vehicles sort of floating around in this zone area at the ready for when a ride request comes through. Um, there's two types of services when we're thinking about the zones. So one is when you request a ride, you might be trying to get somewhat, somewhere nearby in your community. Um, so that would be being picked up within your zone and dropped off at a destination that's also in that zone. 
Um, another possibility with this service is to have the pickup locations inside of the zone, but a drop-off location outside of the zone. And typically um, that would be a drop-off location that has a lot of demand, like a high popular destination such as hospitals, schools, or clinics, um, and also transit stations. So uh, in, our, in the Tulsa, um, Tulsa framework, we're thinking about having drop-offs at specifically transit stations so that microtransit can fit in within the larger uh, bus network and passengers will be able to travel beyond their zone using public transportation service. Um, as far as the specifics of how, uh, where you'll be picked up and dropped off, there's sort of two approaches to that. Um, the first being what's been dubbed either curb to curb or door to door, but generally that means the vehicle will come um, to your home or your pickup location sort of right outside the door uh, to minimize uh, or actually maximize your convenience as far as having to get there. Um, by contrast, that differs from fixed route bus where you have to find your way to a fixed uh, station location. And then um, there's another approach that would be um, communicating a pickup or location or drop-off point that's generally within one to a couple blocks of your starting or, or your ending point. And the reason for doing that would just to be, get, uh, be able to get a little more efficiency out of the um, vehicles that are in service. As far as what the customer would experience when using this service uh, functions, I don't know anyone here in the public has uh, used Uber or Lyft services, but it's sort of similar to that. Um, you make a ride request either on a smartphone app or by telephone to an operator. Um, then as I expressed before, the microtransit software is going to function in real time to match up vehicles that are in the service area with the ride requests that are coming through and uh, optimize a route that would be efficient in terms of pickup times being quick and also pooling any other riders that might be making a similar trip as yours. Uh, then another nice aspect of this service is the arrival notification. So once you've sent in your request, either through the app or through other functions such as text messaging, or if needed, um, a call to a landline, will alert the passenger to um, the status of their ride. So how, when is the estimate pickup time as well as what is the vehicle's progress toward you? Um, I don't know about you all, but when I've used bus service in the past, I'm constantly checking my phone to make sure I can see when the vehicle's actually arriving. So that's just another added layer of, of convenience to offering this type of service. And then the last, um, thing is the actual pickup. So getting yourself onto uh, the microtransit vehicle, um, which I'll describe a little bit more about the vehicles in the next slide. Um, lastly, what I wanted to point out here is that uh, this experience being provided by a transit agency, it's very important to us that the service is accessible. Um, so as far as interfacing with a smartphone app or using the phone, those are uh, designed in a manner so that there's options for those that have difficulty seeing or hearing. And then as far as uh, the transit vehicles themselves, I'll go ahead and advance to my next slide because it's a better picture here. Uh, the transit vehicles will, would, be, um, would include transit vehicles that can accommodate those that are using a wheelchair or, other have, or otherwise have some mobility limitations. Um, so here's a few images of the different types of microtransit vehicles. Um, generally, they tend to be smaller um, because we're only accommodating one to a few passengers per ride. So there's not a need for a large size bus. And that has a few advantages. Uh, they need less fuel and generally, generally are easier to maintain and cost less for the agency. Uh, they're smaller and therefore are a little bit more nimble on the road. So if your pickup location is in a neighborhood or a small cul-de-sac, um, these vehicles would be able to get there much easier than your traditionally large sized bus. Um, so why invest in microtransit? Why is Tulsa Transit looking at this now? 
Um, well, as Leanne mentioned, there's been a pandemic and there have been a lot of changes in how people feel about getting onto a traditional bus route service. Um, there's also been general changes in people's expectations with other types of services that are on demand. So this is a service that has been popularized around the US. Many cities have piloted a similar service to this. So um, Tulsa Transit is looking to the future and how they can better serve their customers and um, particularly where microtransit would fit, um, which microtransit is best uh, service, servicing areas where there's about two to four passengers per hour. Um, so microtransit service wouldn't make sense in a uh, context where there's a lot of demand because uh, then we would be basically providing uh, something that's not as efficient as when there's a lot of people traveling through a corridor where it makes sense to have a larger vehicle fixed, uh, fixed route service. Um, but in the context of Tulsa, we're looking again at these lower demand routes or areas such as the Nightline Service and the Workforce Express Network, as well as Broken Arrow, uh, where microtransit service would be a good fit. Um, lastly, this uh, microtransit software has evolved over time and there's better software options available and Generally, we have best practices that we can gather from other cities that have invested in this type of service. So there's just generally more industry experience to be gained. Okay, so um, now we're gonna take a, about a five or so minute break to see if there's any questions that anyone has so far in the presentation um, on what microtransit service is and what it might be like. Um, after this break, we're gonna talk specifically about um, where and the boundaries of the zones that we're considering for a pilot service. And, and Jane, I know you had a question in chat about microtransit and asking if it was like deviating a route, but with no fixed route. So. Allison, yes. Is that pretty correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there's, it's similar to deviating route, but there's no fixed route, right? It's just um, <laughs> vehicles that are floating within a drawn boundary on the map, um, waiting for ride requests to come through. Um, and it's different from, I, I understand that route deviation currently is used for nightline service, and that has to be uh, made through contacting the agency ahead of time. Uh, I think the cutoff is by 4 p.m. for nightline service. Um, but the difference there also is that these ride requests wouldn't have to be made by a specific time, only about 15 to 20 minutes ahead of when you know you want to leave your home or leave your Ooh. starting. Jane Lansall has another question, unless you want to give somebody else a turn. Yeah, and now if, if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask it. I thought I was unmuted. Am I, am I muted still? Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you are. Okay, I'm good. Um, so my question is, you're looking at low ridership areas to decide where to do this. Um, how are you guys going to know the difference between low ridership that is just normal for Tulsa and low ridership that occurs because of the um, pandemic Saturday schedule um, due to the driver shortage. For example, my route, I don't know if it was a high ridership or a low ridership before the pandemic, but my main reason for not using it is that it's running on a Saturday schedule and it's not convenient to get to work. So um, if it returns to normal, it would be fantastic for me. So I wonder if there's not some artificial inflation or maybe artificial deflation of ridership just because of the Saturday schedule that would change once we got back to normal. Yeah, um, that's a great question. We did look at ridership data predating the pandemic. Um, so we are observing low ridership on, it's not all the nightlight routes. Once we get into the specifics of each zone, I'll specify which routes we're looking at. So there are some nightline slash Sunday routes that are stronger performing. Um, we're targeting four different nightline slash Sunday routes that 
um, have had lower ridership predating the pandemic. And I was um, just gonna add, Allison, if you don't mind, um, as we stated earlier on, just um, to remind people, this is mainly focusing um, again on a pilot um, uh, situation and it will be uh, nightline Sunday is what we're strongly looking at. We are not currently working, looking at our fixed route daytime service except for the 969, the Workforce Express Network, or the Broken Arrow area. Um, and those are already because they, um, one, the Broken Arrow is ran a lot like our nightline service, which is a, a deviated fixed route. And um, the 969 uh, wind route is a newer route and um, has not received the ridership that is needed. Um, and it is not running on a Saturday level service. It is running a full service. And is the 969, is that the express that goes from downtown to Broken Arrow? No, the 969 is the one that starts in Turley and ac actually circulates. Oh, that's why. Okay, I to Yeah, one. it goes up to Macy's and Amazon um, to, to oh. help people. Um, you know, they have a lot of seasonal jobs in that area. And so mm -hmm. we developed that route last year to be able to provide service to help um, individuals that maybe received a job there that didn't have a uh, transportation barrier. So, yeah, well, I was especially excited about Broken Arrow. I've got some clients there and I've been learning how to deviate routes with them. And um, so if you're going to try the experiment of Broken Arrow, I think they will just lap it up. They'll love it. I've got a, well, before I ask another question, I guess I should wait and see if anybody else has questions. <laughs> but I'm curious, since nobody else is piping up, if we're allowed to call, um, let's say the Broken Arrow folks, um, if they're allowed to call within, say, 10 or 15, 20 minutes and try to get a ride, are they calling the same call center that we call for everything else here in Tulsa? And does that mean that the service will be limited to the call center hours? because I know they're about to change. I'm gonna let uh, Allison or Ryan uh, kind of answer that because that is part of the scope of work that they're looking at as to how this will be best be set up as well. Yeah, I think that's, um, we'll be trying to figure that out in the detailed, port the next phase of our study is figuring out the detailed service and Part of that will be contracting and a vendor. And I think that's what we'll be exploring as far as, and that's a bit of a policy question and a cost question once we can figure out how much it would cost to do this sort of receiving the calls um, and inputting them into the microtransit software, um, having that part of the service be done in-house versus being done by a contracted service. Um, so I think, we don't have an answer on that today, but that would be something we'll communicate in the next phase and the next time we reach out to the public. May I ask a question? <clears throat> yes. Uh, this is Brooke Anderson. I'm wondering, um, I know that we're not quite there yet, but um, if we were able to expand this to routes during the day, um, uh, would there be a possibility of having like you know, kind of an automatic scheduling? You know, if you, you know, we go, if we go to work the same place each day, can we be on some sort of subscription or something to have that and not have to worry about scheduling it each morning? That's a great question. Um, Carol, if you're still on the line, I might ask for your help with that more technology piece. So yes, I'm still here. <laughs> and um, there are a number of different ways that that could be done. And um, I don't have an exact answer for you right now, but the reservations process could be set up in such a way to handle that kind of a situation so that you wouldn't have to do it every time. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, just one less thing to do in the morning. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much. Um, 
I, I do um, always have questions for Tulsa Transit. So thank you for helping out and I will um, just be here listening. Thank you. Okay, all right. any more questions down? We'll have another question and answer session a little bit later after we go through the the actually uh, the Microsoft or the, the, the microtransit zones being considered and then uh, the feedback tool. So, uh, Allison, unless there are other questions, I'll let you go ahead and. This is forward. Diana. I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, when it mentioned in there, when you on one of your slides, it showed that it would be it, there was two different ways of doing the pickup, where it would be curb to curb, or it would be where the uh, rider had to go one to three blocks away from their home to a, like a pickup site. Which one is Tulsa Transit considering? I think right now we're looking at either, um, and I think that will be determined um, again in the contracting phase based on what vendors and what budget we have available. It is more of a budget question. Um, the greater the convenience, the more expensive. Um, so I think once we have our costs worked out, um, that's when we would be able to determine that. However, uh, please do voice your opinion on that because it is also you know, a policy question if we want to put more of our budget, uh, making sure that it is more of a door-to-door, curb-to-curb service, and that that's a priority of the public, then you know we could make that a priority with the budget and maybe take away somewhere else if needed. So definitely give us that feedback. Those of us with a disability, that would help if it was curb-to-curb. -curb. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, hearing no other questions at this moment, and like Barrett said, we'll have another lengthier Q&A time after the next portion of the presentation. Um, so I'll go ahead and move forward for now. Uh, so we're gonna do a dive into what the microtransit zones are that we're considering. Um, so just a reminder that this is a zone-based service, so we actually have to determine what those zones are and where they are in the Tulsa region. Um, so now I will walk us through the ones that we are considering. Um, so we're doing an initial review of six different zones. Uh, I, I want to be clear that Tulsa Transit does not have the budget to pursue all six of these for a pilot. Um, we're looking at piloting one or two of these. And so that's part of why we are coming to the public today is we want to hear your feedback on these different zones and that will help us, that will be one of our criteria in figuring out which of these pilot zones are, um, would be a successful one for the public. Um, that's, not, that's also um, a future decision, you know, if these pilot microtransit zones go well, that doesn't preclude the transit agency from budgeting in the future to implementing more of these zones. Um, so as we mentioned before, we focused on looking at replacement of low ridership routes so that some of the Nightline and Sunday routes, Workforce Express Network and Broken Arrow Route 508, uh, the way we have drawn these boundaries is largely sort of following the existing routes where they are to make sure we're capturing those customers that are already used to and already using any of those routes that we're considering for replacement. But also our zones are bigger than just those um, route, route corridors. They go a little bit above and beyond in terms of area so that we can make sure the zone also is serving anyone who wants to make trips that stay within a zone. So we're trying to include both origins and destinations that make sense and are accommodating potential travel patterns. And that includes um, individuals who are more likely to use public transportation. Um, so that would be individuals that potentially are uh, living in public housing, uh, publicly assisted housing, um, are of lower income status, and then we also want to make sure we're including access to larger employers um, and also uh, make sure we're accessing any grocery stores that would be useful in the community. Um, generally, we're, 
our method for drawing zone boundaries as um, what I just described, but in addition, we're wanting to balance the zone boundaries so that we're both accommodating trips that are entirely made within the zone, but also for those that need to travel outside the zone, we wanna make sure we're making connections to other uh, public transportation fixed route service that will not be replaced by this. Um, we also uh, constrain the overall size of the boundary to make sure that the customer only is waiting around that 15 to 20 minutes. And then also the boundaries generally follow either corporate limits of the city or um, large arterial roads. And that's just to make it easier for a customer to be able to quickly recall um, whether or not they are inside a micro transit zone. Um, so I'm gonna walk through each of the six zones pretty quickly here. Um, you'll have a chance to uh, dig into these zones in more detail through our feedback tool that Ryan will walk us through um, on a subsequent slide. But um, for now, we just have, for this presentation, the static images for us to present these zones. But um, once you go into the feedback tool, you'll be able to zoom in and out and see exactly where these boundary lines are and the streets that they run along. So hopefully it will be a useful way to provide feedback and get a little more engagement with these zones. Um, so the first one I'll present is in the Northwest Tulsa area. Oh, and I meant to mention too, we have these big red bold arrows and that's generally there, or that's there to generally describe the travel patterns that we're trying to accommodate. So in the instance of Northwest Tulsa here on the screen, um, we're looking at trying to get individuals from the residential areas to the west and the northwest, um, either to downtown Tulsa directly, um, where they can, there's obviously a lot of destinations in downtown Tulsa where they might end their trip, but it also provides access. Um, there's a tiny little um, bump out in the boundary downtown and that's to serve the Denver Avenue station. So uh, to make sure people can transfer to other services. We also have a large red arrow pointing sort of in the top right of the screen pointing up. And that would be, um, we're describing their travel pattern of anyone that would need to travel north of the zone. Um, that easternmost border is going right along the Peoria BRT route to make sure people can transfer to those stations to, to be able to travel north. Um, so the route that we would be considering replacing with this zone is Nightline and Sunday Route 110. And that currently has about 13 daily riders. And if you break that down over the span of service, which is about four hours, that is right in our ideal um, passenger capacity of two to four customers per hour. Oh, one other thing I'll mention. So uh, uh, we did notice in this zone, um, the land development pattern is sort of stops west of what we're currently showing. There's not a lot of development out there. And that's why um, the zone size is sort of limited to where it is on the west side. Um, on the northern portion of the zone, we did have uh, data that showed a lot of public housing assistance locations. So. Uh, we wanted to make sure we were including that area of Tulsa to be served by this microtransit zone. So moving on to our next zone uh, in North Tulsa, this one again is um, covering the more residential developed parts of this area in Tulsa. Um, we're looking at potential replacement of two nightline and Sunday service routes here. Again, the 110 that was in the previous slide, but also the 401 route. Um, and so we're looking at making sure we accommodate riders that are currently on those routes. Um, so getting them from both the east and the west sides of this zone and making sure that they can transfer to those, um, to those route alignments. We also drew this zone. Um, it looks very choppy on the Northwestern side, but that's because it's following um, the corporate limits of Tulsa. And then we've sort of reached, the, we've stretched the Eastern side of this boundary out a bit further 
um, to reach the airport terminal. Um, we think that's a sensible high demand use to make sure that we are including here um, as that's often a large employer in a region. Oh, and one other point I wanted to, or one other thing we wanted to make sure we included in this zone, um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but on the Western part of the boundary, it bumps out a little bit to make sure we're including the casino that's located there. Okay, so the East Tulsa zone is our largest zone that we have drawn um, being considered. Um, I want to acknowledge up front or share with everyone that if this area of Tulsa is considered a priority for a pilot, it's most likely we would need to break this zone into one, uh, one or two more refined zone boundaries because currently it's quite large. Um, the reason it's so large is that there are a lot of potential travel patterns happening, happening in this part of Tulsa. Um, we're considering replacing Nightline and Sunday routes 440 and 490. Um, the 440 route kind of zigzags uh, across this zone, but primarily as a north-south north route. And then the 490 is an east-west route. Um, other indicators of need for uh, public transit rides in this area, we have uh, many locations of public housing in this zone, and it's not really concentrated in any one part of this zone. It's really spread out throughout. Um, same story with grocery stores. There are some, there's at least three Walmart super centers and many other grocery stores in this zone. Um, there's also a lot of commercial development along corridors in the south part of the zone along 71st, 81st, and 91st streets. Um, so this is one of the zones that is quite large because there's a lot of potential throughout this part of Tulsa. Oh, and um, so we're, again, I wanted to mention that we are, the western boundary is hugging the current Peoria BRT route to make sure we're accommodating any transfers that would want to be made onto that service. Uh, we also drew the northern part of this route pretty far north because we wanted to make sure we're accommodating the future um, Route 66 BRT service. And the, reasons we, the reason we have a lot of focus on connections to the BRT routes in particular is that those routes are really the backbones of the Tulsa Transit Network based on how, um, the, how much frequency that those two services will have. So we expect to, that to have a lot of draw in the region and therefore we wanna make sure that these micro transit zones are serving quality um, fix, fixed route services. Okay, so uh, West Tulsa and Jenks, this zone was drawn um, to potentially replace Nightline and Sunday Route 490, um, which has about 13 daily riders. Uh, we are making sure that this route is, or I'm sorry, this zone includes, again, connections to the Peoria BRT service. Um, this zone, uh, in comparison to the other ones, pretty much hugs the Route 490 service. Uh, it's expanded a little bit to the north and a little bit to the south to go ahead and grab locations uh, in this area of Tulsa that are developed. Um, and then sort of outside this zone on the north and west and south sides, there's a natural break in the land development pattern. Uh, currently, Jenks is not served by the Nightline service, but, but because this zone is already fairly small, we went ahead and wanted to include the developed areas of Jenks in this zone. All right, so that are those first zones that I shared are to replace uh, the Nightline and Sunday service routes that I called out. Um, now we're looking at uh, the next two are more unique in that they are more daytime service routes that we would be considering for replacement. So the first one is the Workforce Express Network. Um, this zone was primarily drawn to trace the current route pattern of 
uh, Route 969. Uh, so no major change there. The difference is on the western side, instead of following the route um, to where it starts and ends in its loop, we expanded the zone all the way to the west to capture all of the development um, over to the west in Turley and where there's again a constant more concentration or high prevalence of public assisted housing and we're hopeful that that's those areas of Tulsa are where um, potentially there are more workers who uh, need to access the large employers to the north and eastern parts of this zone. Um, another thing that we would hope is the case if we pursued this zone, um, there's currently only, I believe, four uh, trips on the Workforce Express network, two very early in the morning and two later in the day. Um, we're hopeful that the microtransit zone would be able to offer a greater span of service so that um, it's in operation when other Tulsa transit uh, network routes are in service during the day so that individuals could be making transfers between other daytime services. And that would include, include connections to uh, daytime routes 110, 201, 410, 460, and the Peoria BRT. Okay, so the last zone is another daytime one. This would be potential replacement of the Broken Arrow Route 508. Um, that route currently serves about 27 daily riders. And that sounds much higher, but um, that route has a daytime span of service. So many more, that ridership is spread out um, many more hours during the day. Um, so when you look at an hourly rate of passengers, it again sort of fit fits that ideal rate of passengers for microtransit service. Um, the zone was largely drawn based on the current um, deviated zone that passengers on the service can um, ask to deviate to. Uh, the difference would be that we expanded the zone past the current one to capture more area, developed area to the east. And um, this, the census tracts in this area also tend to be lower income. And then uh, by similar sort of logic here on the south, we moved the zone up by one sort of super block um, because the super blocks down here tend to be of higher income and less need. So we just sort of did a swap one for one in terms of land area um, to accommodate part of the population that would be more likely in need of this service. Um, we expect that this service would be used mostly for internal circulation, so picking up and dropping off within the zone um, based on how it's used today. However, we did draw and make sure that this zone would include uh, any transfers that would want to be made to routes 902, 909, and 310. Okay, so that concludes my walkthrough of each of these individual zones. Um, I'll pass it over to Ryan, who's going to walk everyone through how to use our feedback tool and how to um, be able to further inspect these zones. All right, thanks. Allison, just give me one minute, I'll pull this up. Okay. I hope I'm sharing. Perfect. So um, as Allison mentioned, we um, in this phase were really, really interested in getting feedback on the concept of microtransit as a whole, as well as uh, your thoughts on these particular zones as we eventually move towards um, developing a strategy and, and figuring out one to two zones that we would like to implement as a pilot. So we're really excited to to share this engagement tool for the project. Um, we will provide a link in chat and, and on the website and other forums here in just a minute. Um, but the engagement tool allows you to comment specifically on a, a geography or a particular point, or just broadly give us some feedback as a whole about the project. So I'm gonna walk you through that real quick. So the first question is really focused on just providing um, a comment. This could be broad. It could be a broad comment about the, the 
the project as a whole, or it could be a very detailed comment. And that really applies to the second portion. So question two is actually a map. It's interactive. We zoom in and out. There are several layers to turn on and off as you zoom in and out. So potential nightline Sunday route replacements are currently on, and now they're off and, and on again. Potential daytime route replacements, you can turn those off and on, as well as uh, other nightline Sunday routes and other daytime routes. One thing that I think is really great about the tool is you can zoom in really far, potentially even find your home if you want to, or a place of employment or, a, or any uh, particular origin of destination that you're interested in. If you get in too detail, you can zoom in too much. You can't actually see the zone. You can turn on uh, the fill version that allows us to um, see the zone that you're in particular in. I was actually outside one of the zones. Um, so for instance, this kind of purplish blue color is the Eastern zone. And if you're, if you're zoomed in way far, you can actually understand that. So I can turn it on and off and see exactly where I am. One other great function is once you're zoomed in and you see that boundary and you see a particular place that you're interested in and you have a comment about that, you just simply mark that particular spot. It'll create a pen. And then we'll know that that comment is tied to that pen. Question three kind of zooms out a little bit. It asks specifically, thinking about the microtransit pilot effort as a whole, please indicate your level of support for piloting a project for these particular routes. This is a feeling thermometer, it allows you to drag uh, from not in favor all the way to in favor. Question four is specific to kind of your information. You have a couple options here. If you want to, you can provide uh, your zip code, last name, and email, or you can uh, submit your comment anonymously. However, if you keep this send re a response clicked and you didn't enter any information and you try to submit, it's gonna prompt you to actually provide that information so we can actually get back to you. So I will unclick that. I will add a couple of items here just for a test. And I will keep this clicked for some your response. Sixth question, final question is, how did you hear about us? Um, we really like to hear, get feedback on this because it helps us refine our process and make our process better for the next public engagement uh, effort. So please select up to three of those. I will continue. And what you have here is um, kind of some base information. This is me and submit with the changes. So that's kind of a new piece. And then what's also great is maybe you had a couple of comments um, and you were able to get all those comments in at one. You can simply go back in, provide your comment, uh, your second comment, third comment, et cetera, about those specific locations um, as you did before. We will be, uh, so your, your opportunity to engage in these tools now, we're also gonna keep this open for the next few weeks or so as we collect this information. And it's gonna be really important as we um, consider the next steps, right? So after this, we'll take the feedback that we hear from you all over the next couple of weeks and from this meeting. We'll uh, continue to analyze and look at the technical information and then we'll come back with the preferred alternative at some point in time. And I will stop sharing. Turn it back over to you. Thanks, I'll reshare my screen. Oh, and just a remark. So um, Christy went ahead and shared the link to that tool uh, in the chat, I'm also posting it on the screen here. Um, and it is also posted on the Tulsa Transit website. We have a project page for the microtransit project. Um, so we have everything that we've shared today. That same information is there and this presentation will be posted there. Um, and that uh, feedback link is also posted on the website.
Okay. So, so, so now we have kind of a longer Q and A time for anyone who wants to unmute or um, just to ask questions about the the zones that Allison discussed or just anything we've talked about up to now. Brooke Anderson, are you able to hear me? Yes. I'm looking at the feedback feedback link. And I do not, I haven't submitted feedback yet. I don't know if these, um, can you tell me, are the neutral in favor, not in favor, um, overall questions, are those required? They don't seem to have an asterisk. I didn't notice. I don't think that they're required. I think the only question that's required is the very first one where you make a comment. Okay, I saw a couple other asterisks, so I think there's a little bit more. Um, yeah, my... the, the other asterisk should be with submitting your uh, information if you want follow-up, but you can click that if you want to do anonymous, and you do anonymous. I think the only required one should just be the first question about what the comment is that you want to share. Okay, so then the... Um, <clears throat> uh, let me look at... I'm going to tell you this is not accessible to those with a screen reader. Um, so it is, again, it doesn't look like it's required, but how did you hear about us is an unlabeled button that does not read. So a screen reader, user, uh, dyslexic, blind, whatever be the case, print disabled is not going to be able to, well, I'll tell you a blind person's not gonna be able to do that. Um, so yeah, I'm we do. That. Hopefully it's not required. <laughs> no. I'll submit and see how it goes. Okay. We do have other ways of receiving feedback. Um, we have the info at tulsatransit.org email. So um, the feedback tool is largely open-ended comments. So any other open-ended comments that can't be submitted through that tool. Um, can be sent either an email to the info at tulsatransit.org address or um, a call can be made to the Tulsa Transit phone number that I just posted on the screen. Um, and that's 918-582-2100. Okay, looks good. Thank you so much. Just wanted to let you know a couple of those things are not, not going to work there. <laughs> Thank you for letting yeah, us thanks, know. Thanks, Any questions about the zones that Allison went through? Okay. And obviously, you know, if you have questions later, you can use any of these feedback tools to ask questions in addition to leaving comments, so. Yeah. Just to be clear though, um, these are, Microtransit replacing the mass transit option in these areas that we're looking at. Yeah, so um, not Tulsa Transit 100% full replacement of their service. This is just specific routes um, that we've identified in this presentation. And in that feedback tool, if you are able to see it, um, Ryan walked through, we can walk through it again. There's layers there to turn on and off and that specifies which of the routes are being considered for replacement. But generally it is a one for one or two for one, depending on how large the zone is. But uh, any of the routes that are dotted in the map um, or labeled routes for re potential replacement, if they're going through the zone, that's one that would be replaced. It's not that we would implement one zone and replace all of the routes we're considering. It's just the ones that have that overlap. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Um, okay. And yeah, also, a little bit. Uh, the, the layering is also not usable, not accessible no. with this. Sorry, Jen, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I had a real hard time following her. So I put it in the chat that maybe a text narrative would help a lot of us explain, you know, what the heck is she was talking about? Because anyway, so I guess I want to know if you use a micro route in an area covered by a nightline route, 
does that mean the night line goes away completely or just that section where there would be a micro route or um, I, I guess I don't understand that because I really was trying to follow along and it just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, so very, very, very specialized and privileged information. <laughs> um, we did. Yeah, our intention is to any of the zones that replace a nightline route would replace that entire route. I think the only exception mm -hmm. would be the East Tulsa zone currently um, cuts off half of 490 route. Um, so that would be pro most likely we would preserve the half of the route that's outside of the zone and remove the route that's the portion of the route that's inside the zone. Okay, so you change the 490 route to stop at the micro zone. Oh uh, yeah, only for East mm -hmm. Tulsa, but the only other zone that would replace that route is the West and Jenks zone. Mm -hmm. um, and because that zone covers the entire route, we would replace the full route. Mm -hmm. But since you're only gonna pick one of those for the test, the pilot, um, you would only replace the one that you choose, wouldn't? Correct, you yeah. Choose yeah. both of them. So yeah. it would still be wherever you don't have a micro. Correct. Okay, all right. And ideally, um, we would move forward either one or two of the routes, depending on how um, the costs pan out in the next phase. But I think we would get the most benefit from doing a, um, zones that either border or o overlap so that we don't need to um, maintain a portion of a fixed route. And that I think would be both an efficiency for the transit agency, but also easier as consumers to understand, to only have to interpret one service being the microtransit service versus like, oh, I need to figure out how to use the microtransit service and the portion left over of a nightline route. Maybe just for, um, we could help you with this accessibility problem that you guys are having. Um, I was on another committee where they were looking at doing some um, something to the transit center downtown. And mm -hmm. one of the things that they did when they were describing this map to us was they were very careful to use the border streets so we could tell exactly where the area was going to be and where it wasn't going to be. And so we wouldn't have this, well, part of the 490 is going to go away and part of it isn't. And mm -hmm. so maybe we could work together on getting those barrier streets figured out and say, okay, the zone's going to start at um, Garnett, for example, if you're talking about East Tulsa, you know, and the zone's going to run from Garnett to 140, whatever, um, okay. what the east boundary would be, and then we'd have a northern boundary and a southern boundary, and of course, if it's the Broken Arrow route, um, part of that, the southern boundary kind of changes, and so we could use the street names mm -hmm. to depict, say, you go along New Orleans, and then at some point you cut up, and I don't remember the name of the street, up to Washington and continue east. And we could describe those boundaries. And if you need help doing that, just reach out to me because okay. I've been trying to do that for clients for four years now. So <laughs> yeah, thank you. And yeah. so is the ideal that that would be described? And you, I think this is a similar, or please correct me or make sure I'm understanding that we need it to be in narrative form so that a reader can read through text that describes well, it. It's if you put a narrative text paragraph on the website mm -hmm. and go to the website and then they can listen to it with their screen readers, um, it's just like any other narrative. It's like, um, which we can also talk about because there's not a okay. whole lot there. Um, it would basically tell where the boundaries are and you would know that if they're, you're inside these boundaries that you could get a micro route to take you and then we would talk about where it would take you. Would it take you to a connecting point? I'm gonna go back to Broken Arrow because I've been teaching that one a lot lately. Um, would it take you to TCC to catch a 310? Would it take you to somewhere else inside the zone? Would it take you outside the zone? Would it come okay. get you outside the zone, bring it back into the zone? And if we could write that up with those boundaries, then people can learn where their boundaries are and say, well, where is New Orleans Street from where I live? You know, I'm above it. So is there a boundary above me and, you know, or maybe I'm below it and am I too far below it? So, you know, they could be able to figure that out by looking online and reading the narratives. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Anything we can do. Extreme. <laughs>
I, I totally agree. That would be extremely beneficial. And I know of three people on this call, too, and myself, who would probably be draftable if you really needed help. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that right, guys? Yeah, um, I would def definitely um, do whatever I can to help because um, if you hadn't gone over this, looking at this map, uh, no, I get nothing from this. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad that <laughs> yeah, people get. Yeah. I have um, kind of a quick question. I think you might have already um, stated it, but I didn't hear it. What is the timeline of? Um, you taking this um, kind of feedback um, before you reach the next phase of your plan. We did not go through that yet, but that is a good transition to our um, project timeline slide. So I'll let Ryan walk through that and then we can take any other questions. Yeah, that was perfect. Almost like we set that up. Um, so we're kind of in that where it says public meetings phase right there in the middle of December. And the goal is to take, as I mentioned earlier, take this feedback, and this has been fantastic feedback so far, so we really appreciate it, um, and uh, combine that with some more, some additional technical analysis that we're going to be doing on these zones as we start to dig into um, very specific criteria and, and uh, data, um, and then spend the next you know, six weeks or so um, starting to narrow down to what probably makes sense for this pilot. And I, I want to reiterate that by doing a pilot, um, it really gives Tulsa Transit an opportunity to, to dial this in a little bit, right? So if we were to do this for all nightlight service all at once, there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, some things to get missed. But by focusing on one particular zone um, or two zones, and then bringing on a vendor to, to, to provide that, that microtransit service, we can effectively dial it in in real time over the course of that pilot and make sure that we're providing the best service possible. And that's what a lot of cities and agencies across the country have done with these pilots for microtransit is allow them to, to tweak and fine tune them as, as they eventually look at scaling them up. So we'll spend that time over the next six weeks kind of dialing that in a little bit, determining that preferred uh, zone or zones. Um, and then our goal is to come back out um, to, to the public in a similar meeting. We have a stakeholder meeting that we have um, in January and then come back out to the public kind of after that stakeholder meeting, uh, maybe virtually, maybe in person to be determined, but bring that preferred uh, alternative, that preferred zone or zones to you all for that, for that final feedback. So uh, look for us to come back in, in January, February timeframe for another conversation. Um, any questions about the timeline or um, any more questions about what Allison had gone over? I will add that, you know, we'll have some more details next meeting about kind of when the pilot would be um, you know, implemented. I think that's a little bit to be determined at this point. Um, there's contracting, there's developing an RFP for that pilot. There's all kinds of things, negotiations with a potential vendor, et cetera, that will dictate that time and implementation period. We should have a little bit more information at that point in time to share with you all. Um, but our goal is to look at, you know, implementing some time next year for sure. And thank you to those that pointed out the um, accessibility issues with our current tool. Um, I will work with our team at Propeller to um, write up a narrative that we can post to the website so that 
the zone boundaries are communicated um, through that method and can be read through a screen reader. Yes. Um, and so like Ryan mentioned, this tool will be open for a few weeks. Um, so we will try to get the screen reader friendly text up on the website, hopefully within about a week. So I believe that is um, our presentation. So uh, are there any final questions or um, anything that anyone would like to ask? Uh, Leanne, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? Um, I sure do, but I think I saw somebody unmute themselves. Um, Serenity, yeah. did you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm kind of thinking about the, the families of our schools that use uh, the transit system, and I know they use it um, often for as a family unit. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, I was holding back on a question because maybe I can research it and find it um, after this meeting, but I didn't know if you should just bring it up now. How family friendly transportation is this micro system? So if I need it to transport my children and me to go to the grocery store, I may take the bus because I'm going to hold my infant and there's no need for a car seat, but this micro system, is it a smaller bus or is it a car? Because when I compare it to Uber or Lyft, I just need to be sure that I'm communicating it well so families can give the proper feedback um, when they're considering how this would work for their family. Yeah, I think, um, I think Carol has dropped off our call, but I think that you would be able to um, request your ride and um, have an input for how many spaces you would need for your ride. Um, and then I'm just rewinding back in the presentation to the one on our vehicles, but this is great feedback to hear that if you, um, in terms of being able to accommodate families uh, as we consider what vendors we would like to use and what vehicles we want to make sure we have in our fleet. Um, but generally they tend to be smaller vans. Um, some micro transit services around the country use sedans, um, but I would say that's probably less often. It tends to be more of the small van or the cutaways. Um, and that's to have sufficient capacity for a small carpool but I think that, you know, that would be akin to providing enough seats for a family. And then also the bigger factor is making sure the fleet is uh, wheelchair accessible. Okay, if there's not any questions, then I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, do you agree, Allison? I do, yes. Thank you everyone who's come and for your time in um, listening to what we've, what we've been studying so far and we will take into account your feedback. I hope um, for, those of the, for those of you that can, we'll, resend, uh, we'll send us some feedback through our tool or through email or calling the agency. And again, we will get that update to our website to have a text description of the zone boundaries. And I will also make sure it's added um, a way that they can, the link for the feedback tool is already on our website, but I will include the email address as well as our call center number. Um, and, and on behalf of Tulsa Transit, I would like to say thank you very much for everybody that has attended today and that we'll um, maybe share this information out. And um, I'm excited to see what the feedback will be and then to see what our consultants are going to come up with. <laughs> That's gonna be the exciting part when I get to come, you know, we get to all come back and talk to each of you on kind of this is where the data has led us to. 
um, and here are the zones that, you know, that we're thinking of doing this pilot program in. As I said, the pandemic has definitely um, changed the views of public transportation and also the way you utilize public transportation. And Tulsa Transit wants to make sure that we can offer the best service that's possible um, to all of these citizens in the city of Tulsa and beyond. So with that, um, I'm going to sign off and say have a great day um, and hope everybody has a happy holiday if we do not talk before then. Sorry, if you just have a second, I have one more question. Okay, sure, go ahead, Brooke. Um, just wondering, uh, what, um, so if we save kind of, you know, the idea, I guess, you know, to kind of, um, curtail the budget a bit and not waste, you know, um, huge buses on low, um, low areas, low usage areas. What's the plan for the saved money? I, it would be for this service. So our aim is to be cost neutral. Um, whatever service we would replace, that money would be the funding source for microtransit. Yeah, there will be no budget increase um, at this time for services. So we have to, it's kind of like when we did our redesign on our complete service, everything mm -hmm. was cost neutral. Um, so we just kind of took the uh, budget that we had and, and readjusted to provide a, a better service on the street. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. you Thank too. you. You too. Thank you, Brooke. Thanks, Have everyone. a great day. Ian, is there any ETA for? Um, are, are you guys hiring more drivers for the regular routes? Is there any work going back to regular service? Jane, we are continuously um, uh, recruiting. Uh, we do not want to put regular service on the on the street and then pull it back out. So we're making sure that we are. <laughs> Definitely stay a little bit as, as everybody <laughs> knows when you try to go out to dinner and other things, um, recruiting is a very hard um, area right now for all industries um, yeah. and transportation has been hit very, very hard. This is nationwide. Um, and again, wow. it's not just public transportation um, industry. Um, I know of other transportation industries that are struggling, struggling to find CDL drivers and, and maintaining them. So at this time, I cannot release any uh, ETA on that, but please be assured that Tulsa Transit staff <laughs> is working their hardest each and every day because I will tell you that everyone here <laughs> that I talk to, we are ready to go back to full service. We want to be able to provide that service um, to our city. Um, we just need to make sure that we have those drivers that will get our people where they need to be safely. And I'm sure you have something on your website where if there are any people out there looking for jobs and able to get a CDL, that they could go online and look those jobs up. We do have a careers page on our, our website at this time. Because occasionally I do try to market to DRS to um, people with disabilities that don't impact driving and, mm -hmm. and so far I'm not hearing anything so yeah we, sure we do people out there to get a CDL if they really were interested and um, you know get a nice job at Tulsa Transit correct mm -hmm. and and since we've given a, a pay increase to our drivers um, it's even more beneficial now <laughs> to um, become a Tulsa Transit driver um, there is information on our career page on our website at tulsatransit.org I do know also that we have posted in many other places, um, such as Indeed, um, they can go on and apply through there. We actually even have on our Facebook page a, uh, a job description that people can submit an application through Facebook. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you Thanks again, on. Brooke, we appreciate it. Thank and you. also Jane, just so you know, uh, along with drivers, we're needing some other individuals such as call center representatives. Um, so please make sure you check out the career page and help us get those people in here where we want to get back on the street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got to make sure those applications are accessible and the software that is used is accessible because I can get you people. 
-hmm. but they need to be Mark a works at a, you work in a call center don't you she's tech support for some pretty big agencies so um she's my guru when it comes to high techie tech <laughs> okay well that's great that's great kind of information thank you and um <laughs> we're definitely working on that we're working on um actually re designing our website so it is more accessible. Um, we do apologize, we've ran into a little bit of problem, um, but we we will definitely, we'd love to um, maybe meet with you, Brooke, and, and figure out how we can make sure that all this is more accessible. Um, I will need to get with our uh, human resource director and um, maybe I can put the two of you in contact with each other. Oh, that would be so awesome. Go for it, Brooke. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment too real quick if I may. Uh, I'm a Lyft rider, you're paratransit, and I wanted to say that I've been on probably 30 to 50 percent of the rides I've been on lately have been with Lyft, with Lyft drivers training other drivers, and they are doing such a fantastic job in making sure that they, you know, follow all the procedures and protocols and, you know, stop at the railroad tracks and, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> So I want to compliment them and, and it's good. I'm happy to see that so many new drivers, because I don't really ride the public transit at this time, but that so many new drivers are at least being hired for the paratransit. So kudos to them. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We'll make sure that we um, share that um, kudos to them. So thank you very much for expressing that. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure they can always use some positivity in their lives. <laughs> so. All right, thank you all. <laughs> Have a great day and hopefully we will be in touch. Take care. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.